Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest voxcasting either side of the breach. When Governor General Marlowe assumed power in Malifaux, he transformed the way the guild operates. He is a consummate bureaucrat, meticulous and by the book in everything he does. But in Malifaux, you sometimes have to break a few rules if you want to get things done. I hope you enjoy part one of Ashes, Ashes, They All Fall Down, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of Breachside Broadcast is brought to you once again by the Brotherhood of the Rat. If you've got swarms of plague-infested three-foot rats crawling up from the sewers beneath your home or business, call the Brotherhood. And if you don't have a problem with rats, hire us anyway if you want it to stay that way. We know where you live. Ashes, ashes, they all fall down, by Mario Takuda. Lucius hated how the governor's manner had devolved into a flurry of administrative absurdity. The distinct deficiency of dread among the common bureaucrats made the right honourable Lucius Gustavius Fitzwilliam Matteson itch. Unlike before, no one doffed their hats, bowed, saluted, or even voiced an insincere salutation as the secretary to the governor-general himself passed through the halls. Staff, guards, and even domestic help went about their tasks without pause. It was appalling. He blamed it on a lack of fear. The current Governor-General insisted on mountains of paperwork that led to decisions that required browsing through unreasonably long documents, or ignoring them, as Lucius tended to do. According to Franco Marlowe, all this resulted in an autonomy that let people do their damn jobs. Ordering the help around on a whim, making threats, and making good on those threats had worked just fine for Lucius for decades. It was enough to make him miss the previous governor-general, the ambitious idiot. At least Kitchener put style over bothersome paper shuffling, even if he leaned precipitously toward the gauche and theatrical. Secretary Lucius Matteson lingered in front of the carved doors to the crown room, where the governor-general held all his meetings. Things were in such a state that there wasn't a soldier or lower-level administrator to cater to him. He had to open the door himself. Reprehensible. Were he the Governor-General, Lucius would never stand for such audacity. With a grimace of contempt hidden behind his golden lawyer's mask, he reached for the ornate bronze handles and gripped them in his gloved hands. The hinges squeaked in mild protest as he hauled the door open. Chaos greeted him. Marlowe's staff braided each other across the long wooden table that crowded the once-refined crown room. At one time, this place had possessed intimidating decor and a presence that inspired awe. Its dark woods, dancing fireplace, and brocade curtains had been gravitas defined. No longer. Now, electric lights eliminated flickering shadows that tricked the eye, stealing any drama the room had. It was such a shame. The Governor-General sat at the front of the room, his filthy, unpolished boots of scarred leather resting next to haphazard piles of files on the table's surface. He'd slicked back his long, dark hair into his usual tidy queue, but dark circles under his eyes and the stubborn set of his mouth betrayed his exhaustion. He pinched the bridge of his nose as he squeezed his dark eyes shut and listened to someone hissing desperately in his ear. The sharp smell of ink from innumerable stamps and pens penetrated Lucius' mask. Papers fluttered through the air like autumn leaves in a tempest. With quiet steps, Lucius made his way into the room. 
He removed a stack of ledgers from the well-crafted wooden chair he'd imported from Earth that waited in his assigned spot. Someone handed him a ledger and a pen and hissed, You have to sign in for the meeting. Attendance check. Lucius curled his lip in disdain. As he perched on the satin seat cushion, Marlow glowered down the table at Lucius. Why are you so late? The Governor General snapped. We have a schedule for a reason. Lucius tipped his head. I was attending to a legal matter that couldn't wait. I don't remember seeing any reports or absence requests about that on my desk. Marlow thumped his fist on a thick stack of documents in front of him. If my scribe could attend me in these meetings, he could get you any paperwork you'd require. Lucius narrowed his eyes. Marlow's face flushed in rage. Absolutely not. Is it so hard for you to take care of your own work, Madison? It's a wonder how you became secretary. Lucius snapped the pen in his hand and dropped the ledger in the middle of the table amid the riot of regulations, reports, and governmental codices. Hand me that folder about those damn smuggling leaks, someone called. Madison, I need those papers. You're sitting there. This is actually important. Lucius clenched one hand into a fist and with the other passed the requested documents to the ungrateful recipient. Ironsides rejected the most recent contract, one staffer, Mr. Jesse, shouted. Lucius noted that Mr. Jesse had stripped down to his shirt sleeves and was wiping sweat from his brow. Kitchener would have been scandalized. Well, get me her counteroffer. I'll look it over tonight, Marlow growled. Next. Secretary, I need those transcripts from the Thrace trial, another woman bellowed. If I had known, I would have had them delivered to your office, Lucius replied through gritted teeth. Great, do that, she shouted. He bolted his other hand into a fist. Someone looted one of the storehouses where we were keeping some of Ramos things, a young woman interjected. We don't know who took them or why. Has anyone seen the constructs in the city? Marlow snarled. Not as of yet, Mr. Marlow, the woman replied. Then it's not a problem yet, the Governor General snapped. Come back when you know more. She hurried away, muttering under her breath. It'll be too late by then. What do you have? Marlow pointed a finger at someone seemingly at random. We're getting reports of rats outside the sewers, Franco, another staffer hollered. Lucius knew him only as Colin, no surname. He even addressed the Governor General by his given name, and Marlow allowed it, putting some semblance of camaraderie over true leadership. Colin continued. I think it's because we pulled our troops after the Resurrectionist cleanup project, leaving the rats to multiply with no higher predator in the sewers. I know, Marlow barked, his eyes flashing with anger. But we have Arcanists running wild, burning down every guild building they can. I need those soldiers elsewhere. Interesting. Lucius leaned back in his chair, the previous slights forgotten momentarily. It appeared that even Marlow could spread himself too thin. His meticulous bureaucracy had become a monster. Adorable. What about my people in the Northern Hills? Yet another staffer demanded. She waved a handful of papers at the Governor-General and adjusted her glasses with her other hand. She looked like a particularly harried owl. They're vanishing without a trace. Even if you don't care about their lives, it's going to start affecting the profit numbers. Damn it all. Take Perdita, the Governor General replied. Colin choked. You said earlier I could have Perdita to help with the rats. Lucius almost snorted, as if Perdita would stoop so low. He would pay a small fortune to see someone try to give her that order. Now she's taking care of the northern hill towns. Marlow's dark eyes pierced the other man, who sat back in his chair with timid movements. The meeting continued as such. What a marked difference from when Marlow had first ascended upon Malifaux. When this most recent governor-general first arrived, his arrogance, his dismissive treatment of his own secretary, and then surprising competence had enraged Lucius Matteson. Despite his internal struggle, Lucius had held his temper, the only outward expression of his dissatisfaction had been several snapped pens, a handful of disrespectful guards reassigned to more deadly posts, and three mysterious strangulations in the slums. He'd shown remarkable restraint. With glee, Lucius realized that his patience had paid off. The numbers seemed to be falling in his favor. Marlow had floundered and displayed vulnerability at last. He smirked under his mask. Lucius observed as the meeting became more lawless melee than conference. He sat still, almost forgetting to breathe as he began to form a plan in his mind. 
Luckily, his associates were too busy to notice that he seemed slightly less human in that moment. Pardon me, Mr. Colin. Lucius leaned towards the administrator. The sewers are quite the labyrinthine wonder under the city, with miles and miles of pipe. Don't I know it, Colin said, not bothering to look at Lucius. The secretary ground his teeth for a moment at the slight. Do you have the manpower required to comb through it all? Not nearly, the man groaned. And without Pedita, I'm left with rookie guild guards. Look, I don't have time for this medicine. He tapped at several columns of numbers in the ledger in front of him. Clearly. Disease is spreading like the latest fashionable fad. The pests have caused untold amounts of damage to infrastructure and resources. Not to mention public perception. You don't have to tell me, Colin grumbled, smacking his hand against his ledger for emphasis. You're trying to make me feel worse? Lucius waited. Those rats are huge and dangerous, Colin began scribbling furiously on the papers in front of him. If memory serves, there are those who earn their keep by dispatching the native fauna, the secretary murmured. Lucius almost smiled at his joke. His memory always served. The rat catchers. Colin paused for a moment and shuddered. They're so creepy. Besides, they hate us. They'd never work with the guild. As a lawyer, and as the Governor General's secretary, I have quite a lot of experience in negotiating with willing and even some unwilling participants, Lucius began. Colin nodded at him to continue. If you wanted, I could give you some guidance in how to approach the rat catchers. Aren't you a persuasive one? Colin mused. In fact, instead of giving me advice, why don't I send you? You want me to confer with the rat catchers on your behalf? Lucius asked, taken aback. You've dealt with all sorts of criminals and the like. What are a few filthy rat catchers in the slums? Colin grinned. Lucius hesitated. Tell you what, I'll owe you one. Colin held out his hand. I can agree to that, I suppose, Mr. Colin. Lucius took Colin's hand in his own and shook it. You can just call me Colin, the man replied, his entire demeanor suddenly jovial. I'd rather not, Lucius said, his tone flat. Whatever you want, friend, Colin crowed. He scurried away. With liquid grace, the secretary stood from his seat and made his way to the large doors. Where the hell do you think you're going, Lucius? Marlow roared. Lucius almost twitched at the informal use of his given name. Governor General Marlowe, I need to ensure that my department can encompass every one of these issues from every legal perspective. Next time, get me an endeavor request, Marlowe commanded, and waved Lucius away. Of course, the secretary replied, as he squeezed dents into his cane. With silent steps, Lucius made his way through the door, leaving the chaos behind him. At night, electric lamps lit the streets of downtown Malifaux, their bulbs buzzing and humming like trapped insects. Lucius passed frequent guild guard patrols, who either ignored him or nodded at him absently if they noticed him at all. He preferred to stay in the shadows. As he crept to the slums, the electric monstrosities turned to gaslights, or even candles and oil lanterns, his preferred source of illumination. He liked the way the old styles of lighting smelled like potential, an explosion, or a conflagration. The electric bulb seemed so sanitized. How dull. The evidence of the rat problem also became more apparent as he walked. Downtown, he saw minimal evidence of the vermin. In the slums, however, the bones of cat and dog carcasses, even the occasional horse, jutted out of the shadows in the alleyways. People who reeked of infection groaned. The dead and dying sprawled, decaying and bloated on the sides of the streets. Lucius wrinkled his nose. How unsightly. This gave him additional motivation to untangle this particular problem. It offended his sense of aesthetic. He made his way to a solid building, one of the nicest ones in the slums, though that wasn't saying much. The paint looked somewhat fresher. 
it looked like an actual architect had a hand in the design, as opposed to the more common, improvised construction of its neighbours. However, like everything in the slums, it had a certain drab and dreary bearing about it. The floor squeaked like chattering mice with every step. Individuals who smelled of the alleyways and sewers, and who wore grime-covered clothes, milled around on the first floor. They eyed Lucius with a certain feral hostility. He carefully stepped around them and headed for the top floor. By the time he'd made it to his destination, Lucius had repeatedly contemplated burning the entire building down or litigating it into non-existence. The heavy wooden door creaked like a tiny scream as the Right Honourable Lucius Gustavius Fitzwilliam Matteson stepped into the Ratcatcher's office. His presence filled the space. Every hair of his snow-white powdered wig obediently stayed in place. His coat, made of the finest material, looked like expensive wine, or, more appealingly to him, fresh blood. He gripped his stylish cane in one gloved hand. The only sound he made was the soft tick-tock of his golden pocket watch. Though he would never admit it to anyone, human or never-born, Lucius had a true weakness for human fashion. It communicated so much, all without saying a word. He could intimidate with the shining metal lawyer's mask that hid his face from the world. His fine silk shirts and tailored suits made his high social status clear to even the most ignorant. And the craftsmanship. He'd never seen anything like it before the strange, short-lived creatures came through the breach. Clothes were the one thing that humans truly offered, besides endless frustration and, one day, servitude. He would kill for unique, buttery, soft, well-cobbled leather shoes. In fact, he had. What do you want? A rough voice demanded. Lucius took in the rat catcher's office in one quick glance. Despite her profession, her office remained uncluttered. She wore a dark woolen suit complete with waistcoat. The rat catcher wouldn't be out of place among his own lawyers, he noted, especially with her suspicious, narrowed gaze and stubborn chin. Displayed on shelves and pedestals around her office were decorative elements from both sides of the breach that cost not only a pretty penny, but also a significant favour. Like a bouquet in a woodwright's shop, the room smelled of a light rose oil and wood polish, not the muddy alleyway detritus he expected. The soft, scratchy notes of a complex orchestral piece floated out of a wooden gold gramophone in the corner. Not what you were expecting, she asked with a scoff. Ratcatchers in Malifaux face a hazardous foe and are well compensated for it, Lucius replied, resting both hands on his cane. And by that you mean, she asked with a glare, you are skilled and I am unsurprised by your wealth, Miss Reinenberg. Lucius turned his head to admire her office again. She nodded in appreciative response. The woman leaned back in her high-backed chair and rested her heels on the edge of her desk. Waving her fingers, as though conducting the music, she asked, So, Mr. Secretary, what can I do for you? I understand that you are quite influential with your colleagues, Miss Reinerberg. Griselda, please. I'd rather address you with the formality you deserve as a prominent figure in your profession, Lucius replied. Well, all right, then. Griselda gave him a pleased smile. She waved him toward a chair with a brocade cushion on it. He balanced himself upon it. The craftsmanship was sublime. Lovely piece of furniture, he commented. From Earth's side, Griselda puffed up her chest. I see that. Lucius let his gaze travel to the window in the side of her office. Through it, he saw the dim gaslights and flickering candles in the gaping, mismatched holes they called windows in this part of the city. He also saw light peeking through gaps in the walls of neighboring buildings. Lucius frowned. When he became Governor General, perhaps he'd remove the entire neighborhood like a blight. It's unfortunate that, despite your obvious success, your offices remain in the slums. Griselda scowled. Lucius had hit on a sore point, just as he suspected from the intelligence he'd gone to significant lengths to procure. He silently congratulated himself. It's not like they'd let us move anywhere else, she snapped. They want our services but don't want to associate with us. 
What if you and I could change that? Lucius let his soft voice take on an edge of avarice to entice the rat catcher. I'm listening. She put her feet on the floor with a thump and leaned forward on her desk. I believe I could arrange for you and your associates to occupy a building in the industrial zone. Griselda narrowed her eyes. In exchange for a tidy sum to eradicate any rats left in the sewers, Lucius said. There are a lot of rats down there right now, ever since the guild tried to flush out those resurrectionists and left the job half finished. Griselda crossed her arms over her chest. A handsome sum, then, Lucius amended. And a retainer for your exclusive, ongoing extermination services. What do you mean by exclusive? The guild would be your sole client. Contractually, of course. The secretary tapped the top of his cane with his gloved fingers. We like our independence, Mr. Secretary, Griselda replied. And some of us have other contracts that we're not willing to give up. I understand. I will strike the retainer clause from any contracts you and your colleagues may sign. Wait, how much is the retainer? Griselda asked. Lucius could see her mind working through the profits and losses, like one of his accountants adding machines. It is quite generous. You could keep up the lifestyle you enjoy now with ease, Lucius said. And you'd have the improved social standing of having offices in the industrial zone. Let me talk it over with my fellows, Griselda said, already forming her arguments in her mind. Though we're an independent bunch, not everyone will want to work with the Guild. I understand. My hope is to engage only the best in your line of work. You and those whom you recommend. I'll have my lawyers deliver a stack of contracts for you to peruse and distribute first thing in the morning. Lucius stood and glided through Griselda's door. I look forward to doing business with you, Miss Reinenberg. Several days after, Lucius entered the squall that was the crown room's distasteful chaos. Colin confronted him, shaking a thick sheaf of papers at him. What is this, Madison? he demanded. Secretary Madison, Lucius corrected him. You said you were going to talk to the rat catchers in my stead. This contract has your name all over it. You're the official guild representative, not me, Colin hissed. Unfortunately, the rat catchers would only agree to sign if the legal document entered into named me as a representative, since I handled all the negotiations with them directly. Lucius settled himself into his seat. That's convenient for you. It looks like you swooped in and saved the day, Colin muttered. Is that not precisely what I did? Lucius crossed one leg over the other and tipped his head at Colin. The other man gritted his teeth and sat down. Several other administrators and bureaucrats quietly applauded Lucius' work on convincing the ratcatchers to join the guild payroll. We're already seeing results, a woman with her hair in a bun pile on top of her head and her arms full of ledgers said as she passed by. Quite the coup, Mr. Jesse said with a grin. Maybe they'll stop working with whoever will toss them a bit of scrip and we won't have to fight against them as much. That was the intent, Lucius responded, with as little condescension as he could muster. Of course, of course, Marlowe's assistant chuckled. The corners of Lucius' mouth turned up in a tiny smile. The secretary leaned back in his seat. The tide had shifted the tiniest bit in his favour, something that had been too long coming. He planned to let it build into an inexorable avalanche. He let his gaze meet Marlowe's scowl for just a moment. Franco, this isn't working. Another assistant Lucius had taken note of, named Gracina Yao, slammed a thick file onto the table. Everyone paused and stared. She swiped at a wisp of hair that had come out of the coiffure pile on top of her head, moving it out of her eyes and glared. Gracina, the Governor General warned. It's getting worse. She began to pace, her trumpet skirt swishing about her legs. Her long sleeves, tight corset, and high neck dress gave her look a certain collected severity that made her seem that much more competent than some of her slovenlier colleagues. You need to deal with these arcanists. They're destroying warehouses and munitions. Several of our couriers have vanished. This is getting expensive. 
not to mention how bad it looks. I have a plan, Grisina, Marlow growled. Can you implement it within the next day? she demanded. Trust me, the Governor General snarled. Grisina shook a finger in Marlow's face. Franco, you're the very one who told me you didn't want any sycophants among your staff. That's why you hired me, remember? This is my pet project, my responsibility. You will give me the details on your plan. Lucius took an immediate liking to Ms. Yao, as much as he could like any human. I have a lot of other things to take care of at this moment. Marlow picked up one of the many piles of papers in front of him and began leafing through it. Then I'll take your written report. Gracina held her hand out with the entitlement of a hungry chick in the nest. I haven't had a chance to put one together. Marlow didn't look up from his papers. Pardon me? The woman asked in surprise. That is part of the official procedure that you insisted on so that we could look through the history of all our decisions. Lucius smirked at this latest failure of the system. If you haven't noticed, I've been busy, Marlow snapped. Well done, how to delegate then, Gracina snarled. She looked around the table. Does anyone else have any good suggestions? Several staff members looked back down at their files and began arguing with each other. Others mumbled words that were unhelpful and unproductive. Secretary Madison, you managed to get something done in the last day, unlike everyone else here. Maybe you have some thoughts on the Arcanist problem, Gracina threw out. He liked her more and more. Under normal circumstances, I would go straight to the leader of the Miners and Steamfitters Union. But from what I understand, we no longer have any negotiating leverage with Miss Ironside. Lucius replied with a slight nod toward Marlow. He continued, I find it unfortunate that she has not the strength of leadership that her predecessor possessed. And? Grisina prompted impatiently. He liked her a little less. As you may be aware, after the previous Governor General's untimely demise and the arrival of Governor General Marlow, I implemented holding zones and legal proceedings for many in the Miners and Steamfitters Union to try to discover which members had loyalties to the Arcanist faction. I had hoped to avoid a situation such as this one. Lucius leaned his cane against the back of his chair and rested his hands on the table in front of him. It would be an easy thing to reinstate that. Some of the staff murmured, discussing the merits of the idea or outright disapproving. Others nodded their heads, bobbing like branches in a breeze. After months of Marlowe's slights, Lucius felt as though he was finally getting his own. Christina screwed up her face in distaste. No, Marlow bellowed. I forbid it. Lucius gave a small shrug. It was simply a proposal. A potential solution. A bad one. Marlow narrowed his eyes at Lucius. But specific and documented, Lucius pointed out. Chatter reverberated through the room at this exchange. It is groundless and immoral, Marlow glowered. Get back to your work, all of you, and you're dismissed, Lucius. The room roared again as people returned to their tasks. Pen scratched against papers. Books slammed open and closed. Lucius grimaced as he slipped out of the door. He would never run Malifaux in such a haphazard way. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malifaux and part two of our story.